Um, okay, so I um, wrote a summary of what we discussed yesterday. Uh, you know, just to remind ourselves, there was this 4x4 four four Hamiltonian that we all know how to diagonalize by now. Um, it has all phases from a vial semi-metal to an insulator to a Dirac semi-metal. can be written in some compact way with some matrices that you can read from here. We wrote it also, also as an action uh, with some term that we identified that uh, broke uh, some, uh, well, what we call particle Lorentz invariance. And, um, you know, we added here a matrix that allows us to um, incorporate the Fermi velocities. And, uh, yeah, the, the spectrum we found it was gapless depending on, gapless or gap depending on the size of B squared and M squared. So basically when the mass dominates, then everything gaps out. When this Lorentz breaking term dominates, we have a, a semi-metal. And then we can move, we can move the vial nodes in momentum with the spatial part of B or in energy with the temporal part. And so we wrote it as a four vector. Remember that B squared is this thing. And the, the spatial part broke time reversal. The um, temporal part broke inversion. And so, um, okay, so we're gonna, you know, leave this part here for, for a while. Um, and now I'm going to try to connect this with models that people have been using, uh, or discretized models in the lattice. And actually, it's going to connect to um, to something uh, Michael Wimmer talked about yesterday, just models in the lattice. And this has been a recurring topic in high-energy physics, how to regularize fermions, how to regularize um, or construct theories that reduce to you know, you have a low energy theory and you want to, um, you put it in a computer, how you, how you discretize it. And there are many ways of, of um, latticizing or discretizing this, this theory. So, I, I'm going to call it discretize. Um, I'm going to talk about three, but there are many more. So I'm going to talk about one that I'm just going to call lattice, lattice fermions, because nobody uses this one, and so it ha doesn't really have a name. But it kind of it's useful to illustrate why it doesn't work and why we need others. But it's the most naive thing one can do. I'm going to talk a, a bit about Wilson fermions that are very important for us in condensed matter. And I'm going to talk about inspiring Wilson fermions. So this third is just some example of the things you can do. And I don't think there's a realization of this in condensed matter, but it would be cool to find one, I guess. Um, or if there is, maybe somebody knows, but I don't. I don't. Um, OK. so. You know, just to throw some names if, in case you encounter them, there are also staggered fermions, twisted mass fermions, many, many fermions. But I guess this ones are, um, you know, pedagogical in, in some, some ways. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with lattice fermions. So for that, I'm going to use just, you know, for, for this part, I'm just going to set all Bs to zero. So I'm just going to go, you know, spatial part of and temporal part just to zero. And so I'm going to get the, I'm going to use the Dirac Hamiltonian. And now, you know, if you have, if you have a linear dispersion and you want this to happen at low energies, uh, the easiest thing, the easiest map you can, you can define is, so I'm here one, is to take your, ith component of momentum and, and change it for a sign. And the mass, let's say we don't, we don't really think this is going to you know, cause any problem, so we just call it big M just to you know, change its name, but it's really the same object. Um, 
because, yeah, because, um, you know, I want, so let's say I want to uh, put this theory in a computer and I want to discretize K and, um, or I'm a condensed matter physicist and I know that I have a lattice. And uh, I want to recover something that at low energies, meaning when, when K is small or I, where I expand K around some point, I recover a linear theory like this one. So I can do this. And immediately you realize that, well, if I expand, you know, I, I get a Hamiltonian that would look like, uh, well, simply, let's say, sine Ki, sigma I, M, whoops, M, M, sine Ki, sigma I, something like this, right? Sum over I. Now, if I expand around gamma, then I'll get kx times sigma x, ky times sigma y, kz times sigma z. And I'll get back to this guy, right? However, we, you already see the problem that if I expand around 0 pi pi or pi 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 or pi 0 pi, all the corners of the Brillouin zone will have this Hamiltonian with some signs changed in, you know, some, some Depending on where I expand this, the sign will have either it would be one or it would be or it would be k or it would be minus k. So, so this is um, a problem that is known in high energy as the fermion doubling problem, meaning that when I put my theory on a lattice, the lattice is periodic, so I have other points where I recover copies of this Hamiltonian. And in fact, I recover copies of of this guy already. Like if I just you know, imagine I, I just have a two by two Hamiltonian and I try to do the same trick, then I would see that I can never have, actually this is a minus, sorry. I can never have one single chiral fermion. There was always, there will always be, at the corners of the Brion zone, there will always be uh, what they call doublers. And, and this is a fact that uh, can be proven rigorously mathematically. So meaning, you know, if you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, whoops, if you have a mass, you would see something like this. So, whoops. I guess something like this. And if it's massless, you would find something like this. So you would find like not only, you know, not only a so this is K, this is E, this is K, this is E. So not only at at gamma, I would have gapless degrees of freedom, but I would also have, a, you know, let's say pi, zero, zero. Okay, so we have to, we have to do something about it because, uh, well, we would like to, you know, if we, if we want to uh, ask, so if we, if we ask that we recover a theory like this in the low energy, we're having a problem because we're having two to the d copies of this theory where d is the space dimension. So, so in fact, what Nielsen and Niemi approved, this is, theorem, is that um, under your assum assumptions of unitarity, locality and translational invariance, I will always have doublers unless I break chiral symmetry. Okay? So, always pairs of, you know, let's say, vials at low energies unless
How do you get that? You just diagonalize the simultaneous with m equals zero. So this is m, sorry, yeah. thanks. So this is m equals zero, this is m not equal to zero. You know, you remember that when m was zero, here we had a Carroll symmetry, right? Um, what we're saying is that, you know, unless, uh, unless we break that Carroll symmetry, we cannot get rid of these copies. And I'll explain how you do that, because that's exactly what these fermions do. They break Carroll symmetry to get rid of the doublers. What is the? Which object is Oh, the theory, I guess. Yeah, just the uh, Lagrangian, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I'll I'll write a kind of non-local. So now, basically, now what I'm what I'm going to do is so Wilson fermions evade or write some other version of this lattice theory by breaking Carroll symmetry, and we see that how that happens. So Carroll symmetry would be broken. And these guys kind of break Carroll symmetry in an interesting way, and also, uh, depending on how you define it, can break actually locality. So, so that's that's what I'm going to do next. So, is this clear? We just, you know, try to put this on the lattice, and we encounter this doubling problem. So now we we're, we're going to try to find some other route by sacrificing chiral symmetry. So that's number two, those fermions. So in this case, the map is similar. So ki goes to sine of ki. You know, remember i is like it's yz. But now, what I'm going to do is M, instead of writing just a single, just a, just a mass, I'll write it as sine squared okay, over 2, which, you know, you can also write as 1 half some 1 minus cosine, okay. Okay, so this is a sum that goes over x, y, and z of the sine squared ky over 2. Now, you can also write just using trigonometric identities as this guy. And the reason I write both is because high energy books usually use this, and we in condensed matter use, usually use this. But they're the same thing. Um, and the reason you do this is that now, well, you see what this does. This term here will add a mass at the corners of the, of, the, of the Brion zone even when m is 0. So when I take the limit m to 0, uh, the corners of the Brion zone would be gapped due to this term. So the, the, the dispersion now look something like, you know, with, generically it would look something like this, but I can fine tune it. I mean, you, so this, you know, you, you apply this to the Hamiltonian I had before, which was this. So you apply this map to, to the Hamiltonian that's down there. You diagonalize it, and you find that, you know, you can find a dispersion that goes like this. But here you're sacrificing Carroll symmetry because, you know, the, the even this even though this parameter is zero, this is not, and so I cannot define this gamma five that we that we defined uh, yesterday. That define Carroll symmetry. So I, I um, so this is no longer true for. Uh, sorry, this is true, but. It, it's not longer true that I can, for, the, for m equals zero, I can commute that matrix and say that that's the symmetry because of this term. So, 
So those are called Wilson fermions. And in fact, Yori saw a Wilson fermion yesterday in Michael, Michael's talk, and actually I think in uh, other talks that I forget which, but probably T2's. Um, because the Hamiltonian for a Chin oscillator that uh, Ivo described is essentially, so, so now I go to two plus one dimensions. So now this is a sum over, let me write it explicitly, so that's no confusion. Okay, y sigma i, m minus cosine kx minus cosine kz, sigma z. So this, this Hamiltonian is defined in two coordinates. Sorry, this is y. Two coordinates in momentum space, so it's a two plus one, so two space dimensions, one, one temporal component. And this is a 2D version of the, the Wilson fermion. So if you compute the whole conductivity of this guy, depending on the mass parameter, you would see that, you know, uh, you can be in a phase where you have chern number one or a phase where you have uh, chern number zero. So a chern later is nothing but a Wilson fermion, actually. And this is, uh, if you remember from yesterday in Michael's um, lecture, he defined uh, one half of the, he said the one half of the BHZ model that described even you know, a one half of the spin hull insulator. This is exactly it. Now if I go to 3D, uh, let's see, let me erase this. If I go to 3D, so we're talking about this part of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so now I'm going to apply what I just said, and I'm going to get, you know, sine ki gamma i. So this is h. I'm not going to give it a name. So sine ki gamma i plus m minus sum over cosine ki gamma zero. So I'm just applying this thing here. And actually this Hamiltonian describes a topological insulator, a 3D topological insulator. So this is sum over you know, x, y, z, sum over x, y, z. And this, you can convince yourself that, you know, if you change the sign of, of the mass, uh, you know, you can expand, for example, you can expand this, this Hamiltonian close to the gamma point, and what you would get is, you know, k dot gamma plus m minus you know, two, oh, sorry, three, right, close to the gamma. So this, you know, this, is, this would be my m here. And so if you start, Playing around with the sign of this mass, you can you can you know uh, define a phase that has a po positive gap, let's say, or a phase that has a that you know they would look the same, but you know you can define something that has oops, a plus gap, you know m say bigger than three. Of course, you know there's some scale that I'm setting to one but you know, you're in 3t or m less than 3t. And the boundary between these two guys, so if I, if I let m vary in space, the boundary between these two guys would, would have a 2d gapless Dirac fermion. And so that's a topological insulator. So this Hamiltonian actually can describe topological insulators. So you see that Wilson fermions are essentially the way uh, one can construct uh, topological phases very easily. 
Um, so one can, in principle, do the same for the whole Hamiltonian. Because, well, these things don't depend on momentum, so they stay the same with this map. And that will you know, have a, a very rich phase diagram where you can find, um, you know, you can put this in Mathematica with this, with this or in quant, let's say. And, uh, you know, you get this map applied to this Hamiltonian with a B0 and BI, and you start playing with the parameters, and you see that you can find phases that look at, like a topological insulator, a weak topological insulator, vile semi-metal, Dirac semi-metal, so you can get all types of phases just by doing this simple simple map. So this is a, power, a pretty powerful, powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah, Fermi is in the lattice. I guess that's how they formulate it. Yeah. Well, I, I broke, you know, you know, it looks, it looks like I, I can tune, I can fine tune to have just a single, just a single Dirac. Um, but here, Nielsen Nenomia doesn't apply because I'm breaking chiral symmetry. So they're, they're just saying that under these assumptions, you will always have pairs of vials unless you, uh, you break chiral symmetry. So by this, by adding this guy here, um, you know, I guess what they refer to chiral symmetry is, you know, setting this m to zero. You know, before we didn't have this term, we set this m to zero, and we had like a block diagonal Hamiltonian, but then we had a lot of doublers. But now we set this m to zero, we have this guy here, a direct fermion. But, and all the doublers are gapped. But this gap precisely breaks chiral symmetry. Uh, well, it depends on, the, depends on the values of the parameters, actually, because if you crank up m to infinity, you know, it becomes larger than any other energy scale, and it's kind of like a local potential. Like, if I write, if I write this in real space, it would be a, just a square lattice, in a way. I can, I can write it as a square lattice. And this m is an on-site potential. So if I crank it up uh, to infinity, then I can write it as a, as a localized, so it's trivial, it's a trivial phase. But now if, if, if I close the gap and open it up again, then I, I go into the topological regime and I cannot write it like that anymore. I think, yeah. I guess in 2D is even, maybe even more obvious. I mean, usually, well, I guess um, that's the art, I would say. Yeah, I, I mean, you can start promoting things. Like, for example, here I chose the same hopping for each k, so, but you can, you can, in principle, have different coefficients here. Same as here, you can have an isotropy. So you can, you can try to model some particular, uh, or like fit, let's say, some particular band structure with, with you know, allowing these parameters to vary, and, and you know, if you're interested in a particular material in a particular part of the low energy, you would know that, you know, as, as we learned from Andre, you would know like what symmetries, so you, f you would first look at the symmetries, then say, okay, well, I want to describe my, uh, you know, the, the low energy excitations close to the gamma point, and so these are the terms that are allowed in my Hamiltonian, and so you're, you, you put them all with all uh, in principle, different coefficients and start start playing. Yeah, but, but I mean, if you if you see like uh, you know, if we go to the supplementary material of all this like vial, uh, the real the real materials like TAS or so on, you would see that essentially 
they're kind of generalized versions of this, this is Wilson fermions, essentially. I mean, yeah, of, of this, this Hamiltonian. But yeah, yeah, depending on what you want to describe, you would do one thing or another. Okay, so um, um, if there are no more questions about Wilson fermions, I'll go to describe the third type, which is kind of more exotic. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's, you know, it's never used, but I don't know, maybe somewhere, someone here knows how to realize it. So it's worth describing. Also, it illustrates how other things can, can, be, can be done beyond Wilson fermions. So, Ginsburg Wilson. So what this guy did was Ginsburg. This is an R. Uh, what this guy did was okay. Let me let me um, you know. So remember that our our Carroll transformation from the other day was something like this. So what they want to do is they want to promote this uh, transformation to be the following thing. So A is the lattice constant, which I implicitly assume one in the other examples, but let's, let's leave it here and find it. So, so the continuum limit would be to take the lattice constant to zero. So this guy would disappear and I would recover the same, the same Carroll transformation. So what one could expect from this, from this generalization is that Carroll symmetry is broken, but only to first order in the lattice constant. So corrections, lattice corrections would break, would break Carroll symmetry, but only at order A. So what they do is, so I haven't defined this D, but it's some sort of operator. And I actually would ne will never define it because it's quite a complicated one. Um, but if you want to know the action in general, or what this D really does, um, so let, let X and Y be um, four coordinates. So I include time and space, but there are two of them. So that's why it's non-local. So D sits where usually the gamma mu, k mu, or gamma mu partial mu kind of sit before, sat before. And they, so one can show that, or one can, one can ask whether there's a operator D that satisfies such that, so this is gamma five D a lattice constant D gamma five D. The way you have to read this last term is actually, I'm gonna write it explicitly because if not, it might be confusing. Is say X Z gamma five D Z Y. So you see what this guy did was, let me replace this gamma mu by D and ask whether there's, I can define this D to anti-commute up to order A with gamma five. So if I take A to zero, this guy disappears and I have, I recover this, this type of, this type of uh, um, commutation relation and I can define a Carroll symmetry. And now the question is what this D is and the D is just a solution to this equation. And in fact, Ginsberg and Wilson pro, um, they, they proposed this in, I think, 82 or early 80s, but it took more than 10 years for actually, for somebody to actually give a, an expression for this guy. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say what, what is that, but the most popular version of D, um, or one solution, let's say, let me call it, is, it's called, an overlap fermion, so it's it's a solution that. Um, okay, before I say that, 
as you see, you know, I, I kind of broke locality in a way, and I also broke chiral symmetry, but all, only at order a, you know, that is constant. So that's, that's how um, I evade Nielsen and Nemiya. But, uh, you know, I have to give a, um, a, a form for D. And in fact, D can be, can be local, because as I say, I'm, I'm still breaking chiral symmetry. And uh, a guy named Neuberger gave, gave uh, an operator D that's local. So it actually only depends on one of these coordinates. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a delta function, or a yeah, Kronecker function. Uh, it, that it's local, but, but still, you know, there's, you can write a finite, finite uh, it's a matrix, and, and satisfies this equation. So, and those are called overlap fermions, or he called them overlap fermions, for reasons that I'm not going to discuss. But just so you know that there's a solution to this equation that's local, and that you can write it in some way. So, as far as I know, overlap fermions don't really exist in condensed matter. Um, I'm not sure if there's a fundamental reason or not, but you can you can dig into it. And yeah, so this this uh, Ginsburg Wilson fermions are nice because they recover kind of nice properties when a go to zero, but they have sort of corrections. So you can define anomalies, you can define things like that, and they would be uh, modified by terms that are order one in the lattice constant. Okay. So this is all I have to say about lattice fermions. Is, so now it's a good point to take questions if there are. If not, we will go to the responses of this uh, theories to external electromagnetic fields. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess for them, but for us, we always come from the lattice, in a way, so. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, this is we've been hearing that how, you know, this, there is a lot of physics uh, just dictated by sciences and so on. And I guess that, you know, if you want to do some theory about some system, which is, you know, some continuous and then to discretize to do some, let's say, magic, Change the symmetries of the problem, right? You lower the symmetry, so you put them, you know, to go from a continuous to a square lattice, you break continuous translations, you break rotations, so. I mean, does it have consequences? Yeah, I guess, I mean. Okay, I guess uh, the point of, of um, introducing this, as especially uh, Wilson fermions, is that it's an easy way to construct topological phases without thinking too much. Uh, you get, you know, you, you start with a low energy theory, or at least like if you start, if you like starting from a low energy theory, it's very easy to uh, construct things that you can put on a computer or, or just simply, um, you know, make sure that they have topological phases. I guess it's, it's a tool for modeling. Like now if you wanna um, model real materials, then now you have to like, uh, Think harder and go along the lines that Andre was was thinking about, like thinking about symmetries and thinking about that. So, I guess the point is also that you know you can ask the question, and this is partially of what I'll do in a second: is that is our responses to external, let's say, electromagnetic fields completely determined by this theory? Meaning, usually we think that you know if you have some low energy excitations, and you, you know, perturb them uh, with, a, with a small electric field, a small magnetic field, then you can, you can find the linear response. And so in principle, this theory would, would say, okay, compute the linear response with this theory, and you would get an answer. But in fact, that's not true. You, you will see that there are some intrinsic ambiguities in these theories that, since we relaxed Lorentz symmetry, they start to appear, and, they, and those, those will be fixed by some, you know, connecting the theory to, to the lattice in a way. Uh, so.
OK, so great. So now, exciting part. So this is point two of the list that I guess. So yeah, so I was, as I was saying, it looks like if, you, if I give you a low energy theory and I ask you what's the conductivity, you should give me a straight answer. You know, you calculate it, go to your you know, mini body book or whatever and just calculate it and give me an answer. Turns out it's not that simple sometimes. So quantum field theories can be finite but undetermined. So what do I mean by this? So I'm pretty sure you have heard, actually we heard it from Jens the other day, that you heard that sometimes you have to renormalize quantities. What does that mean? You calculate observables or you calculate, you know, you try to calculate, if you like Feynman diagrams, you calculate Feynman diagrams or some observable. And you very quickly realize that sometimes the integral you have to do is divergent. And so you have to regularize in some sense. You have to put a cutoff. You have to use some, some sort of trick to, um, to kind of tame or like you know, this divergence. Now then what you do is, is you say, okay, well, I'm going to hide these divergences in, in my coupling constants and this coupling constants are going to run or these observables are going to run. And that's the beta function that, that Jens uh, showed. How with, as I scale some parameters, system size, energy, then this, uh, coupling constants or the observables that I compute with them, they run. But this is something different. Here, observables will be finite. So the integrals will still be, will look divergent, but when I compute them, there, there, would, no, there would be no divergence. However, the result will depend on the regularization, meaning if I, there are many ways of, of regularizing theories, and each one of them will give a different result. And this is bad because you know, if we were asked by an experimental, what's the conductivity of this? And you, you know, have three methods and each one of them give a different answer, what, what do you say? You go, you know, you, you leave physics and go surfing. So, so maybe that's what we'll do today, but, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully there's a, a better way in life. At least we could choose to, to uh, keep on in physics. And, um, and so what I'm, I'm going to illustrate this fact with, some examples, and I'm going to end up saying that this is one of those theories. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is in one plus one dimensions, and it's very similar to this action, but it's actually the simplest action you can think of. So it's, I'm going to put a two here, gamma mu, k mu, minus. Okay, so what is this? So let me, I could define in principle the, the matrices if you want. So I just have one direction, so I just have one temporal, one spatial, and there's one gamma five matrix. And if you go back to the Hamiltonian language, you will find this is Hamiltonian is very simple, actually. Well, let's say I just have just two, two chiral states. It's already diagonal. I mean, I wrote it already diagonal in the diagonal base. So, so it's just you know, two Actually, I draw them separately, but they're in the same same point in momentum space. Um, maybe I should draw them in the same. Point. So they're, they're just two chiral fermions, one propagating to left, one propagating to right. And now I want to ask, what is the response to an electromagnetic field? So I want to calculate the current. So how do you calculate the current? Okay. So I want to calculate the expectation value of the current. So, you know, 
remember that this mu is 0, 1, 2, 3, so the current is defined as rho, the density, and the vector current. Maybe there's a C or something, but it doesn't really matter. And I'm, I want to calculate it at a given momentum. And what you might remember from your you know, field theory, you all said that you were exposed, but if not, I'll remind you, that the current operator I can define as functional derivative whoops, of the action with respect to, respect to A mu. And this thing is going to depend on A mu because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calculate it as a perturbative expansion in this uh, coupling constant or this, well, or this uh, field. And so it's going to be, it's going to have a term that's linear in A. It's going to have a term that's quadratic and so on. But I'm I, I want to calculate a linear response. So this is P. And this thing we call the polarization function. Okay. So, how many of you know to cal how to calculate the polarization function? One, two. Okay, maybe I'll, maybe I should uh, explain how how this happens. So, okay, how many of you know what's an effective action? Okay, <laughs> so the effective action has this thing in it. I'll show it right now. So, effective actions. So, let's, let's see. So, le let me write the partition function. It will depend on A because A is an external field. I'm not going to integrate over this A. And as you might remember from your field theory courses, I can, I can write it as a path integral. See, over, well, I'm over this Grassmann in variables of E, I, S, Psi, A. So this S, Psi, A is whatever, whatever action, in this case, it's going to be this guy. But whatever action I can think of. And the effect, effective action is essentially saying, well, let me suppose I can Suppose I can do this integral, and let me write something that looks like an, like an action, but I already did this integral. So I'm going to define it as, as this object, and I'm trying to calculate it perturbatively in A. Okay? Um, now, well, this theory is quadratic in the fields, and this is a Gaussian integral of a quadratic action, so I can I can write it as a determinant, and in fact, I'm going to write it in the following way. So where do I get this from? So it's the determinant of the let's say kernel of this action. That's just Gaussian integration. If, if you don't understand this. This step is just a mathematical step. It doesn't, doesn't have any physics. So what is this that I have defined here? This is actually this object. So I'm going to call this, uh, this guy here, define it as Green's function to the minus 1, actually with an i, or minus i. So Green's function to the minus psi is just i over gamma mu a mu. This thing here, I just define it as my current, and the a is the a. Okay, so actually maybe with an e. So this is just this object. Okay, and now. Um, I can write it as this, using the properties of the determinant. 1 minus g0 minus 1, j mu, a mu. OK, so I just pulled out this is, sorry, this is the minus 1. So I just pulled out the g. And 
this factor I am not going to really care because you always, uh, well, there's some normalization when I calculate observables. So I always divide by the partition function without fields, and this, this guy is going to go away, so I don't, I don't really, really care about it. So I, I have to calculate this object. So how do I do that? I use another identity, which is this guy, which is very important. It's always used. So terminal of a matrix, I can write as E trace logarithm of the, that matrix, okay? Actually, you can learn all of this in Alex's book, by the way. Um, I guess. So, so now I can expand, so I can write this determinant using this. So you see E to the trace log of A is the determinant of A. So what's A? A is this. So E trace log of A, so this is, trace log of A is exactly the effective action. Okay, so the effect, effective action, if I write it fully in case space, it would be, uh, you know, choosing some normalization. I'm gonna already expand the logarithm so I'm going to assume that this, this guy is small and expand the logarithm. Trace of G0, J mu, A mu, N. Okay? So I used, I used this thing here, I equated it to this, identified that this is the, this is the effective action, and a is one minus something small. I expand this, that something small, and this is the series expansion. So I wrote the effective action as an expansion over A, which is what I wanted. And now I can say that I, I'll keep the second term, because the second term is the one, you know, the, the, the response is the derivative of the action with respect to A, so the second order term is gonna govern linear response. And so the second order term is gonna look something like, so S effective N equals two is gonna look something like a half DK. I mean, don't trust the prefactors that much, I guess. Trace G of K P halves. Okay, let me. Let me write it. Let's write it. Right here, so S effective N equals two is what? Is something that looks like DK D to the pi over D then there's another integral. I trace G zero. So this is trace of G K minus pi P halves G of K mu G of K J K P halves. And then we have an A new here with this P. And there's an A new. Actually, let me write it like this. forgot how, how this goes but um, but the point is that the point is that I expand this I'll get to second order the second order I have this thing squared right so I, ha I will have two Gwing's functions two currents contracted with two two A's and this is going to be my effective action and now I have to take the derivative with respect to one A or the, you know, the 
the variation with respect to one A. So this is going to kill one of the integrals, and it's going to kill one of the A's. And I'm going to left with this times an A. So this is just the polarization function. So what I did is I calculated this object. And derived a form for this guy. So this is this is the I'll write it I'll write it here in a bit more. So this object I'll I'll be using a lot polarization function. But this this is very really standard, uh, really standard uh, perturbation theory actually. So here I wrote, I wrote it, you know, I, I generalized it to, you know, the, the current can depend on k, but for my particular theory, the current is independent of k, so I can write it like this, okay? If you, don't, if you didn't follow this, this is in every quantum, quantum uh, field theory textbook, the, pr the point is that this is just a way of, of writing an expression for this polarization function, which is just Green's function, current, Green's function, current, and it's, sometimes written as a diagram. So you have you know, current here, current here, J, G, and G. K plus B, K, K, K plus B. Okay, yeah. Yeah. We don't need to. We're just uh, we're just calculating this linear response in a in a non-interacting theory. It's gonna it's gonna have a surprise at the end, I guess. Five minutes, great. Yeah. So maybe maybe I'll get to the surprise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a class. It's a background. Yeah. It's exactly exactly. Okay, so, so I'm not gonna go into the details of how you calculate this object, but basically you plug in this guy here, plug it here, you calculate the traces, and you do the integral. And in fact, you can, you can prove that, okay, so one thing I, can, I have to say is that how does this um, integral behave? Um, so you see that I have two powers of k here, and I'm going to have, so this goes like 1 over k, and this goes like 1 over k. So k squared over k squared. So it's, this integral is logarithmically divergent. So I have to regularize it in some way. I have to either integrate over a cutoff, or I, uh, another way is, is uh, you know, doing it in some arbitrary dimension d, and then taking d to b2, which is called dimensional regularization, dim reg, or I can do many other things. So the, the point is that there are many ways of regularizing this, this object. And no matter what I do, I'll always find this, this form. I can decompose it into some part that, so note, note that this depends on p, by the way, so just external, external momentum. So it's like I'm shining light with a momentum P and seeing what the current is. So I can decompose into a finite part, a part that I don't need to regularize, and, I, and a divergent part. And I can write these two guys as finite part is just one over pi over P squared. And the uh, okay, let me call it uh, C. So this C uh, parameterizes the results I get when I use different regularizations, and so you see that that generically I get an answer that depends on how I regularize the theory, but in fact, this, this here, it's not a problem because I can impose 
gauge invariants to get rid of this ambiguity. The way I do it is I realize that I'm calculating this object, J mu, which I know that has to satisfy this because it's charge conservation. So this is just saying that, you know, this thing is zero. So it's just charge conservation. So this means that if I write it in a momentum space, it means that I, if I apply a momentum operator, so this is just the momentum operator to the current, this has to give zero. But we know that this object is also P, oh, yeah, let's see, P A nu. And so this equation, this thing has to be zero for any value of A. So, so charge conservation, in fact, implies that this object here, P mu pi mu nu, is zero. So this, this thing here has to be zero, which sometimes we refer to this, this condition as the photon being transverse. So you're kind of projecting into, into P. But okay, so, and now you will see if you, if you just multiply with P here, you will see that there's only one value of C for which this condition actually holds. And this value is C equals one. So C equals one is the only value that I can choose here to preserve gauge invariance because when I apply P here, I get, here I get a P squared, P squares cancel out, get P nu, I get P nu here, but with a factor a half. So this has to be one to exactly cancel the other. So in this case, we can breathe. There's no ambiguity because we impose charge conservation and, and we're fine. So it seems that even though the object that we're calculating was regularization independent, uh, we fix this ambiguity requiring this symmetry that we know has to hold. However, tomorrow I'll show an example where you impose gauge invariance and the ambiguity still holds. And this is a problem. And then, but in fact, it's a very physical, there's a very physical reason of why the, this is. And this theory actually has that same problem as well. And I think I'll stop here and take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>